Thank you for the invite. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I do run the St. Louis Hadoop User Group. We're almost, I think we're 360 strong now. And we have, I think when Jim came and talked uh, about Spark, I think we were out at 45, 50 people attending. So we've got a really nice community there. Um, and I'm the organizer. And I would encourage if anybody's doing anything entrepreneurial or interesting or um, doing something at a, a business that's really compelling in, in, with regard to Hadoop or any sort of product in distributed computing, I would encourage you to ping me if you want to head on down to St. Louis and uh, kind of tell us what you're up to because it's always neat to, to hear what uh, other people are doing. Um, so when I was, I was thinking about this talk, uh, I first just want to start with a story of like why Splice Machine exists and just be very honest since this is a, a Hadoop group. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my experience with Hadoop. Um, I was fortunate enough when I started out to uh, try to aid the world's largest retailer um, in adopting Hadoop. And uh, we went through this process and we ran a POC. It was really impressive, right? We took these massive files of point of sale data and we put them in Hadoop really fast and we thought, oh, this is great. Um, and then we could run, we could do some hive type queries on top of it. We thought, oh, this is the way to go. And then as we really started thinking about what this project would look like, it was thousands of data sources from all over the organization being updated all during the day and night at different times. Um, the data would have duplication in it, so we'd have to dedupe the data. Um, so there would be data corruption issues, so we would need to be able to, to put constraints on the data to make sure that we didn't just put garbage in and try to query that. Um, and as we started getting into that, they said, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, when I read CIO Magazine, it said Hadoop was this thing that's gonna change the world, and John, you're telling me it's a file system with some files sitting out there. So okay. Um, and then, <laughs> then there was an executive who sat me down and said, and furthermore, if you really wanted to make this thing work, you should be able to hook applications we already own up to. <laughs> I don't want a team of 100 people writing you know, some NoSQL serialization stuff and updating and thousands of lines of Java code. I've already got that. I've got all the SQL that we've written. Um, we've already got applications like a Primo, Unica, Cognos, business objects that use standard ANSI SQL. What, what's going on here? After he said that to me, I said, wow, that's, that's a good point. Um, and that was about four years ago. And um, I was also fortunate enough to do, um, to aid with the kind of big data re uh, rationale and reasoning um, with one of the largest biotech companies in the world and also a uh, consumer, pro one of the largest consumer product companies in the world. And uh, the biotech is interesting because they were doing genomic type data and their problem was, kind of a little bit of a, a variant, but um, they would they would like to be able to update data. That's a novel concept. And while they're updating it, they want the people who are scanning and querying it to see a consistent view of that data. Uh -huh. That kind of makes some sense. That's kind of what uh, this, this retailer was, was, uh, was proposing to me as well. So, um, and then I started asking, well, how are you going to interact with the data? And they said, well, SQL. I said, well, what are you going to use for SQL? And they're like, uh, uh. And then that kind of project <coughs> just stayed in kind of research land. And then at the consumer product company, they wanted to run a complete CRM re repository on Hadoop. And the more and more I looked into that, I thought, how the heck are you going to, I mean, there's nobody who can do that. So about, um, I guess now it's been about two and a half years ago, um, I partnered with some, um, some people, some colleagues from a prior venture, um, and we started Splice Machine. And this is kind of the, the, the moment where it's not very dramatic. We wanted to build a relational database on top of Hadoop and HBase. We want people that, that are used to doing standard Oracle, Postgres, MySQL workloads to be able to run that on Hadoop and HBase. We want to, and we use standard ANSI SQL 99. And why was this important? I wanted a transactional system. 
I wanted one that can work with any of your existing applications, whether it's Hibernate, Unica, Cognos, any of these different tools. Um, I wanted to be able to work without having to do customizations or change SQL dialects. So that's when we started the company. Um, to date, we've raised $22 million, and we are around at about 50 people. We're headquartered, uh, headquartered downtown in San Francisco. And, and while I'm talking, if people have questions or anything, just yell out. Um, I did that during Jim's presentation. I think I freaked him out when he was in St. Louis. So uh, please feel free to yell out, and um, I'll answer. No, this is Chicago. They're used to it. Oh, okay, good, 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 good. Um, okay, so why is this important? Um, this is the classic graph. You know, data is doubling every two years. Um, but what's more interesting is operational data is growing really fast, and operational data stores are under a lot of pressure. Um, not just little data marts or you know, snapshots of your data warehouse to, uh, for people to run analytics on, but just operational data stores in general. So what I always say when I'm talking to people is say, you know, go to your IT people and ask them how many Oracle Rack instances they have. And they'll say, oh my gosh, I have th you know, thousands of those. And then I said, well, if you go back and ask them next year, there's going to be a lot more. So this data growth is growing extremely, extremely quick. Here's, what, here's kind of what, what, what's happening in our environment. People are throwing data away. We only keep 60 days of data. I hear that all the time. Oracle's really expensive. My database is hitting the wall. Um, you know, users keep getting those spinning beach balls. That was the best one I've heard today. Um, that, you know, this thing's just not working in the relational database. Okay, so there's, you know, the future of databases. Scale up or scale out. And clearly, people are excited about scale-out databases. What does that mean? That means really small machines that act in concert as though they're a singleton database. You connect to it like an Oracle Postgres, um, but it's smart enough to farm the computations down to the nodes, um, but still function as a, a relational database. So who are we? We're the Hadoop RDBMS. Um, so we try to replace old RDBMSs with the scale-out SQL database. Does that seem very complex? I mean, that, that was just kind of what we wanted to do. And it was just the specific problem of Oracle, MySQL, Postgres scaling, um, and being able to update data on Hadoop. I want to start with a case study, and then I'll get into the product. But I think sometimes case studies get you a sense of, okay, what, what are these guys, what do you do with this thing? Um, there is a marketing services company called Hart Hanks. Um, they're a digital marketing services provider. Mm -hmm. They do real-time campaign management. So if anybody's worked with like a CRM type repository where you have the Primo, Unic, uh, uh, gosh, there's so many different tools now that do list selection on top of it and analytics, uh, campaign type analytics. It's a really tough environment because it's a complex OLTP and OLAP environment. So it's been traditionally a non-Hadoop environment. No one would say, let's put this thing on Hadoop. Even though they need scale and they need cost reduction, uh, most people say, no, no, you can't do that. Um, you, know, you can put files on to do, you can query those files, but this is a totally different thing. The, the application's writing, you know, who's participating in campaigns, it's a transactional type, type database. Um, so they use tools like Cognos, uh, Unica for the campaign management, uh, and Ab Initio for uh, ETL, their ETL tool. Their challenges, they basically do this for, I think, seven, I forget how the number of, um, customers they do this for, but each one requires, you know, Oracle Rack type infrastructure, and it's extremely expensive for each of their environments to have these, these Oracle Rack infrastructures. The queries were too slow. Um, things were getting worse, so the data is growing, and this thing just keeps getting slower and slower. Um, and they looked for about nine months for a cost-effective solution. So I looked around and said, I need something that's really affordable. Um, but that can handle this type of workload. So does, I mean, did everybody get kind of cross-channel campaign? Yeah, go ahead. I don't see Cognos or an initio Oh, good point. I don't even know what the solution diagram, someone threw this up, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I don't even know what the solution diagram is, but um, I'll, I'll bear with that. Um, but yeah, so it, it's basically a system where it's doing cross-channel campaigns, real-time personalization, so they try to respond in real time 
Unica's got a nice event-based system. Kind of hard on the database, but it's a decent, yeah. When you say requires it too slow, is it because it has, um, because of the volume of data, or are you talking about the data model and the, uh, and the database are not optimized? Great question. I'd say both. Um, in their case, I think they spent two years optimizing uh, SQL. So I'm pretty convinced they did a decent job on that. Campaign management's a stinker. It's really hard um, because even for a, a medium-sized retailer, you send out, let's say, four million emails, three or four million emails mm -hmm. to your list. To really accurately be able to score that and to do that is a decent OLAP workload because you've got to look at all the transactions for those people during a time period, and then you know, your control and test group and really get a, a sense of what happened. It's a decent amount of activity, and you have to do that while you're actually functioning as a list selection tool. I mean, do you remember how big your data is? Um, so most of, and I, I want to make sure I'm not giving away the farm or anything, but um, in general, not specific to Hanks, but people in this use case generally are struggling with 3 to 12 terabytes of data. Okay. And everybody says, that's not very much. Okay. But that's what we see with Postgres, MySQL, and Oracle. And there's a lot of people in that space. Now, could they go out and buy Exadata maybe and solve that? Possibly. It's just that's a different cost structure. Um, so our initial results, uh, we received about a 10 to 20 price performance improvement. Uh, we were about a quarter of the cost of the Oracle environment. And we were three to seven times uh, faster. What it was of existing Oracle environment or existing? Uh, the existing Oracle environment. So if you think about our environment, our environment's, was, um, so they were five little one year pizza boxes. They were four grand to pop. Um, so five times four, 20K uh, for these, this, this hardware that's running on. Um, and then in, um, I don't think they've published who their platform play is, but then a license to a platform play and a license to splice machine. Yes, sir. No, no, it was all three tools. That's what made it an interesting, I think. That was why it was really interesting for us as one of our first customers. Because we really wanted to show this whole concept of, hey, you have this operational data store. Everybody's connecting to it and partying and ripping data out and loading data concurrently. And it's a big train station with things going. And um, that's why we, we picked this as one of our first big challenges. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Good question. Um, and I'm going from memory. Um, most of this was based on reads. Our inserts are much faster, but the HBase is really good at inserts. And that's kind of what it's known for. But how do you um, perform with updates? I'm sorry? How do you perform with updates compared to the relational data? We're, so in general, um, HBase type databases are much faster because we don't really do updates, we do inserts. We just do a new insert and we use, in our case, snapshot isolation to merge the data back together to understand the true record. Um, but it's extremely quick because it's, an, uh, and I'll get into HBase, but it's an LSM tree. So what's happening is as data comes in, it goes into a concurrent skip list, which is a pretty efficient um, real-time structure for keeping ordered data. And then while that happens, you're doing a write-ahead log entry. So you're just uh, putting those write-ahead log entries. And in Splice Machine, we batch our write-ahead log entries. So we do it pretty efficiently. Um, so our write pipeline, I'll, I'll get into this as well, we have a parallel write pipeline where when we write data, let's say we want to write a million rows from one place to the next, we'll batch them into million uh, row chunks and we send those extremely quick and uh, asynchronously and we don't block reads. So as we read a million rows, we're just throwing data into to HBase as fast as it can um, and it's doing bulk write ahead log updates. So our, our writes are extremely fast. Um, so I, I think this number is much more around the read criteria, because that's really what's um, the stress on the user, what they're waiting is for. Hey, I want to read this. And the read is a read-write. So they read it, and then they write it into a temp table, and that's kind of how Unica runs. But yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, we, use for, we call it Splice Machine, but yes, it's a, it's a platform play with HBase, and then Splice installs in HBase, and then poof, you've got a relational database. And do you have any data points on how big was your server and memory? I don't have those right here. That's a great question. Um, I think in this case, I, I don't want to talk specifically to their environment. 
in general, these usually are about 16 core environments, and they usually have a relatively sophisticated Hitachi SAM hooked up to it. Um, and memory is usually in the 128 meg range, if I remember for this. But I, I, I keep, that's in general. I won't speak directly to them because I don't, I don't know if they've allowed us to say specifically what they're running on. Um, but yeah, so we really focus on price to performance. That's our important metric uh, because the reality is databases can run faster and faster. They just cost an arm and a leg. So we really focus on how much does it cost to get the hardware, um, get the platform, whether it's MapR, Hortonworks, Cloudera, and then how much is Splice, and what does that look like compared to Oracle, and at different tiers, uh, whether it's Exadata. Exadata's going to perform much better, but it might be have a higher cost. Yes. Now, the data we are talking about, what is the volume? Uh, 3 to 12 terabytes in general. Um, this was kind of in the middle range of that. Uh, so, yes. What well, yes, was the recovery plan objective of your data points in terms of if something went bad or went south for whatever reason? How fast or how, how, how long would it take to, not how long would it take to recover, but how much data loss would you actually incur? Um, so this is a service sort of concept. So um, people will be loading data or doing sort of operations on this database. Um, so your question is, you're the saying. RTO. What was your RTO? Um, so we said we'd have, we, we would guarantee no data loss, which is difficult to do. Um, any environment. So we have write ahead logs that are uh, literally F synced. So they're, they're waiting for the file sync on, on multiple machines. Um, and we've got dual uh, name nodes. This obviously kind of gives away that we're not on that bar in the system because we have dual name nodes. Uh, but um, yeah, so that, that type, of, type of environment. So we basically lock it down to where it's guaranteed durability um, for that. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? Changes to the replication? To the replication? Uh, no, we usually do replication three, um, just because in this case we did tell them that we wouldn't, we wouldn't lose their data. Um, so we thought that seems like a realistic uh, frame. The, the thing it really hurts us on is a little bit on writes uh, when we only have like a four or five node cluster. Um, but you know, the servers are of such poor quality that it's probably a realistic <coughs> setup. Cool. Keep going. Um, some of the use cases, I just want to give kind of general ones, uh, digital marketing, data lake, fraud detection, personalized medicine, and Internet of Things. And I want to actually get, get into the product and show it to you. Um, real quick, uh, some reference architectures for operational apps. So if you have some sort of like Unica type tool uh, that's doing, you know, I think a nice use case for us is OLTP, OLAP app mix. So if you have an app that expects to be able to do both, which most... Most apps fit somewhere in there. They do both transactions in some sense, like they update data, um, and they also do some sort of analytics or grouping of data. Um, so we're really trying to go at that Oracle market, right? Um, and there was funny, I was talking to uh, an analyst and he said, you know, when we are thinking about the company, we're building it and doing things, and he said, you know, how many customers does, um, oh, what's the name of that company? Uh, Teradata have. I'm like, I don't know, millions, I don't know, who knows? And he said, no, actually, it's like 1,500 customers. And that was a while back, so maybe they have more now. And he said, do you know how many customers Oracle has? I'm like, uh, a lot. He said, 400,000 or something at that, at that point in time. And he said, you know, the, the, the biggest challenge he saw was that people looked at databases as OLTP, like a Volt DB, something that's very tuned for, for uh, transactions. And he said, people look at databases like um, Impala, for example, which is tuned for analytic type queries. And he said applications actually sit in the middle and require a certain set of functions to be able to actually run. And he's like, that's the place where you want to play. That's where most of the, of the applications in a, in a place, um, you know, where most, why, why Oracle is such a, a, a tremendously successful company. So this is for an operational application. Um, operational data lakes, so our data lake concept is a little different. Um, the, the general data lake concept is just throw some files, and then eventually, if somebody wants to run some analytics against it, they can do that. And the data just kind of sits there. And it's not cleansed. It's not constrained. It's not structured. Um, and there's pros to that. So then you do a lot of um, uh, you do schema on read, right? 
So you don't really apply the schema until you read the data from the files and you say, okay, well, this is an integer and this is a double and this is a date. Um, in Splice, our data lakes are a little different. Uh, we apply schema on write. So what does that mean? That means we can enforce constraints, like primary key constraints. We can um, import you know, uniqueness constraints, referential constraints. Um, we type the data, so if there's something wrong, like your, your data's jacked up, it's not gonna be actually loaded into the system. Um, so it's much more like a traditional relational database. So it's structuring the data um, and, and enforcing the things of a relational database. Um, I've done both, and I think there's value in both. Um, we have clients that you know, run different tools against flat files and others against things that are in splice. So when you have a need for a relational database and you're working with Hadoop, that's kind of where we want to do. Does this make sense to everyone? Okay. Do you provide connectors for some standard OLTP systems like SAP or Oracle? Like Great question. So we had one POC we were doing with SAP, um, not with SAP directly, but with a company that was using SAP. Um, we haven't built like, you know, we basically have ODBC, JDBC, uh, but we haven't gone like, we're definitely behind on the connector. Like, and I don't even know what the connectors really are, to be honest. I mean, a lot of that is just some business logic um, that someone's put together to connect to SAP, which I think has a lot of value for organizations because then they don't have to build it or pay people to build it. Um, but we haven't really gone down the connector route. We're very much ODBC, JDBC, and then um, we have our own um, like loading commands that you can run in the database that'll load it from HDFS into, into Splice. Um, but as far as have we built massive connectors, no. Uh, we do have, um, with that said, we do have uh, a demonstration with Node.js that we're doing. Um, Grails, um, so we have like a, in a Ruby on Rails sort of uh, demo, I remember that. Uh, we have um, a PHP with ODBC demo. We have a couple different ones that we've, we've put together to kind of demonstrate both ODBC and JDBC functionality. Sir. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I still can't. I'm. The the. Apache Pig. So we've done input output formats. So we call it Splice IO. Um, this one's right. So it's basically input output formats, and um, we're just finishing up the connectors with um, H catalog. Um, so well, you know, our big thing is we if somebody's like has Impala or something, they should be able to connect to us. Or if they um, want to take our data and put it in drill format, they should be able to do that, right? So on this fabric, which is becoming Hadoop, which is a you know heavy read, heavy write fabric, you want to be able to have your relational database and your you know MPP type platform be able to work together um, and be able to move data in a parallel manner across that fabric. So you know, we are building all the different MapReduce components because we want to integrate with all these different products. And I mean, the machine learning libraries and the whole ecosystem, because I think it's really powerful. Yeah. Yes, sir. Schema and writing, you referenced, or you mentioned constraint checking, or checking yeah. constraints without checking. I'm assuming you're talking about just a data type, or are you talking about like check constraints? Check constraints, yeah. Like, so legitimate relational database. So um, key as well? Yeah, yeah. Involved? You so, got to do that, so unfortunately. Key, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, that's just kind of, you know, our, our goal is like put what people expect, and I'll kind of show how we did it. Um, and I think it'll illuminate when you see kind of how we, how we went about doing it. And I'll get into more details if you're interested or um, either way. Um, so this is your data lake. What's, so what's different about our data lake? Um, it's applying schema on write. So you're not going to have junk data there. We can do deduplication, updates. Um, kind of behave more like an operational data store than a data lake. Because um, I think the data lake concept came out not being able to update data and not wanting to apply schema on, on write. So it's a little different. Uh, the data warehouse and data marts here, uh, we see a lot of use cases where those are, you know, these great, these great analytic tools that people are building, whether it's Impala, Hawk, um, Drill, um, testing, or et cetera. So there's a great amount of, uh, you know, data warehousing type applications that are coming for Hadoop, and, and that's kind of where we, we see ourselves more as trying to be the, the operational data store. Um, unified customer profile is another one we get hit on quite a bit. So that's something where you have a high concurrency and you're streaming. So if you're streaming data in, everybody says, I'm going to use Spark. It's great. 
Um, but the key thing is using any streaming technology, you need to sync. Because the stream can only hold so much data at once. You need a place to actually put the data so then when you get your stream in, you can actually query it quickly and say, hey, I got some data from John. Can you give me all the information about John so I can make this decision and, and move on the stream? Um, so this is one that we see quite a bit of, uh, where you have streams, people are using Kafka, all kinds of different technologies, which is great, um, but really looking to put a concurrent sync on, and that's kind of our focus. And these were some of the, so when we, when we picked our first customers to go out and do POCs with, we tried to pick different database technologies to go up against. Because we thought, you know, I'm sure someone's going to clean our clock. Or someone's going to have a feature that they need that we don't have. And that was, some of that was true. Like we, we, when we were going through it, we'd say, oh, they're really good at X. Um, you know, one example was sequences. Sequences are really hard in a distributed system. And that was one of those things where we really had to tune the heck out of it and figure out, like, how are you going to do the compare and swap on the single? You know, we went into all this detail about how we're going to do sequences. Um, so there were certain features that really drove our development, and it was nice competing against all these products. In general, I don't like Hive on this chart, personally, because it's, it, it's not really the right place for it. Um, for me, it's really about the first three for us. It's really about people who are doing updates to data, um, and are doing asset properties. So I'm big on relational database uh, technology. Um, cool. Do you have this for DB2? Um, okay, so I'll talk a little bit about DB2 is a weird one for us because I'll, I'll get into this. Uh, we're built on top of Apache Derby, which is uh, DB2, it follows DB2 syntax. So we get all these weird environments where people are like, you can't use our SQL. I'm like, I bet we can, because if you use DB2, we can do that. And what's been a big advantage for us is a lot of these packages have DB2 dialects. So we get to walk all the way in with Derby or DB2 dialects, and we know that they will run successfully, um, which is really powerful for us. Um, and I'll kind of go into the what we did sort of thing. So, um, so we tried to, I, I'm not a big fan of combine the best of both worlds. What we wanted, really wanted to do is say, look, Hadoop is going to be the, the fabric for storage, file system based storage. And that may change over the years. It may still be called the dupe. It may be more memory fabrics. There's going to be a lot of things going on. But in general, I think there is going to be this file system that's a distributed file system. And on top of that distributed file system, you have to run a relational database. And those were the four big things for us SQL, real time updates, ACID transactions, and ODBC, JDBC support. So what did we do? Well, when we went out to build the product, I thought, I really want to build a SQL parser. Not. So I looked at databases that existed out there. And Apache Derby is a really neat one. And I've got a slide that goes through the whole lineage of Derby. Um, but we decided to pick Apache Derby, which is a SQL 99 RDBMS. It's Java-based, completely Java-based. Um, it's used actually quite a bit now on our cell phones. Um, it's an extremely lightweight database, um, which, which was really appealing to, to us. And it gives us ODBC, JDBC compliance. It gave us unit testing. So they have 10 years of unit tests that they've built for things like NIST, which is your um, SQL 99 compliance testing. So they gave us a lot of unit testing. So we didn't have to hire 10 people. You know, that's one of the hardest things about building a database is you, your team that does your testing is probably bigger than your de development team in some sense, because you're building all these different tests, because SQL can be very complex. Um, so that allowed us to get ODBC, JDBC compliance and all these tests. Uh, Apache HBase was the one we picked. I wanted a consistent database. Um, so we went out, when I first did it, I looked at every, I, mean, I looked at Voldemort, uh, Cassandra, I mean, I've looked at every key value store out there, um, ran performance tests, uh, looked at everything, and, I generally followed what the guys from Facebook said. It's really nice to have a consistent database. It's nice to be able to reason about it, to know if I write and read, I know it's, it's what, I just, what I just wrote. I don't have to think, well, did I get a quorum? Or, you know, I'm trying to reason about an eventually consistent database. So I, I followed their guidance in some sense um, and kind of figured that out as we tried to build it on different, different uh, key value stores. Um, scalability is nice because you have a proven scalability story. Um, 
even with some tweaks. I mean, Facebook did a decent amount of tweaks to get it to scale like that, but it is an architecture that you can see scaling to, to petabytes. Okay, so Derby. Uh, it's modular, lightweight Unicode. Uh, Unicode. So we got I18N, which was one of the cooler features. So now our SQL and our um, error messages and everything, um, you can go and sell it in France, you can spell it, spell it in Spain or China, um, and they'll get appropriate Unicode, you know, error messages for the, for the different languages, which was a big thing for us, because we want to be able to take what we do here in the States and, and put it around the world. Uh, it's, mo it's very modular, very lightweight. Um, it was nice because it had authentication and authorization built in. So what we got for authentication was awesome. So we, we have native authentication where the user's encrypted in the database in a table, and you can change their information. Uh, we got LDAP authentication, so you can use a directory service. You've got custom. They were clever enough to build a custom authenticator, so you can implement your own class to authenticate uh, users with their username and password, and it can be against whatever system you've built, wherever. Um, so I thought that was a really, and you can do it with no um, authentication as well. I thought that was really cool. The authorization goes all the way down to column level security, um, which I thought was really nice. So you can restrict the use of columns all the way down to columns. Um, it has okay concurrency, at least has a concurrency model. Um, and I'll talk about how kind of its model is an Aries-based model, and I'll get into that a little bit when we talk about snapshot isolation. Um, it was kind of a, a little bit of a, of a tough model. Um, project history started at Cloudscape, Formix. Long story short, both IBM and, and Oracle uh, interact with this. It's, part, it's called the Java database now. So it's got a nice community, and it's a very mature product. It's been around now 12 years. It does have a lot of advanced features, which are interesting. Uh, stored procedures, which is really cool. So you can run stored procedures. Uh, there's a company in the U, I think it's in the UK, um, that can convert PL SQL to um, our Derby stored procedures, which I thought was really, really cool. Um, and they're in Java, so you can just write whatever you'd like. You can do result set handling, uh, the like. They have triggers, which are really nice, so you can. Um, you know, do the sort of OLTP sort of triggers and things you like to do. Uh, supports two-phase commit, which is neat when you're trying to update Splice and other databases, and you're going to have to do two-phase commit. Uh, it does have that protocol, which I think is a really, uh, it's like supports JTA and things you might be doing in a Hibernate. Uh, updatable views, uh, has full transaction isolation support, encryption, um, and you can just do custom functions, which I think is really neat. So you can just create your own custom functions um, in Java. So it allows you to use any Java library out there to manipulate your data. So I wanted to kind of just walk through Splice SQL processing. This may be down in the weeds, but I'm the CTO, so I get there pretty quick. So if I, if I, if people start, if, if you think I'm too in the weeds, say, or if I need to go low or go like this, so I can at least know kind of where I'm at. Um, so if you're in Java and you want to execute a SQL statement, you create a prepared statement. What does Splice do? It looks it up in the cache. So when you connect uh, to HBase, there'll be a, basically when Splice comes up, port 1527 comes up on each HBase region server. You can connect to it and run SQL on any of them. It's headless. And you issue your, your statement. It'll look it up in the cache. It'll parse it using uh, Java CC parser. It will bind it to the dictionary at that time. And our dictionary is under snapshot isolation as well. So what does that mean? That means um, you know, dictionary can change just like data. And somebody could be reading a table uh, that has already dropped a column, but he's in the middle of a read, so he still sees the column. So this is very much following the Postgres model of snapshot isolation. I know that sounds complex, but if you think about it, you're a, a user and you say, drop this column. That's great. But you still have reads going on, and you can't throw an exception to them, and you can't thank you for the invite, stop their processing. You have to wait. That read should see a consistent view of the data and the dictionary when they ran the query. So that's where we spent a lot of time, probably maybe too much time in the company doing that. Um, it'll then optimize the plan, so we have a cost-based optimizer, and I'll go through the different join strategies that we use. So it's a full cost-based opti optimizer. Um, we actually generate code for the plan, um, which 
is kind of interesting. Let me see if I can uh, pull up some code here. Wouldn't be a, a Hadoop talk without some code. So this is the code that we generate. So um, everything that you run in Splice Machine actually is generated into byte code. So your entire plan becomes Java bytes. And those Java bytes are shipped around to all these different nodes that are interacting with Splice. Um, but this is an actual plan where you're, uh, in this plan, you're reading from a couple tables um, and you're doing, uh, let me look here, you're doing a, a grouped aggregate, so you're aggregating some data. You're doing a projection on top of that, which is a fancy way of changing the number of columns. Um, so this is an example of the plan. So it's actually written into bytecode um, and then shipped to the nodes. When you go back to rerun the statement, this bytecode is already generated and you're ready to go. You just instantiate the plan and you go. Uh, which is the power of doing this. So most databases, if you're going to try to say, I'm, quote, real time, you can't parse every query. You have to, it, you know, you, you have to be able to say, I've already got a plan for this. Boom, go. Um, what's up? It's a soft parse, right? Yes. Um, but hopefully that makes sense, that you need to have a plan for it. Um, in advance, because plans take a while to generate, because you could have multiple tables. And you don't persist your plans, you keep them in memory, right? Um, great question. They are in memory. So you have an act, the, the bytecode's in memory, um, and then they, all, they are uh, asynchronously stored. Um, so when you start up, you can look at those and reference them. And you do reference them with bind variables up there, or is that only through literals? Um, no, you can do bind variables, um, and you can do literals, they'll recognize that as well. All right. Do this up there, bind variables? I'm sorry? Yeah, so we do blobs, globs, all of those sorts of data types, all SQL 99 data types. Uh, is there any you know, stuff, user optimizer where you provide a plan to the user and user can change? Yeah, so you can do uh, join order fixed where you say what the join order is. You can also hint uh, the join strategy, and I'll get into all the join strategies. So if you feel like you know better than the optimizer and you say, no, you know, you really should use a merge join here and not a nested loop, you can hint that. Uh, but there are some join strategies that are not valid for, for that join, so it'll spit back and say you can't, can't do that. But yes? Is there a tool that provides the cost of that query? Yes, it will, it will provide, and um, you can do explain, and it'll provide a cost of the query. And it'll break down, and I can show that in detail for you. So parse, generate, optimize, and execute. Um, you know, the optimize is determining the feasible join strategies. I think we went into this, so I'm going to skip through this. Um, but this is just giving a little bit more, um, more uh, information on that. Okay, so what did we do to Derby? Derby is, uh, their store, where they store da data, is actually a block file based, which is similar to most um, singleton type databases, where you're storing blocks in the database and you're reading those blocks, and they're on the file, local file system. We changed that to HBase tables. So I'm just telling you kind of the guts and what we did. Uh, indexes were B-tree in, um, in, in Derby. Uh, they're dense indexes in HBase. <coughs> Fancy way of saying every row in the base table has a corresponding row in the index. There's advantages, disadvantages to that. Uh, we will be implementing different indexes, probably like bit set, bit map type indexes. We'll do a lot more, but right now we just really focused on, on this piece of the indexing strategy. Concurrency. This was the one we spent the most time on, and I'll go into this in a little more detail. Um, it's a lock-based ARIES system. Fancy way of saying when you update data, you lock it, which doesn't scale, um, which sucks, right? Um, so what we did is we replaced it with an MVCC structure, multi-version concurrency control. And luckily for us, HBase is an MVCC structure, right? So you have timestamps on your data. Um, so we use that timestamp to build a snapshot isolation system. Now ours is very complex um, because there's a lot, and I'll try to go into that in a little more detail. Uh, but that's, that's where we focused was, hey, we need a really a lockless concurrency system. Uh, project restrict, the predicates were all on the centralized file scanner. Now the predicates are actually pushed into the HBase filters. Um, and what that means is, in most systems that interact with HBase, they'll push things like equality type predicates. So column one equals three. Um, but if they get into things like first name equals, you know, tick, percent, John, percent, tick, something where it's not, it's something where you have to evaluate. 
Um, in general, you'll have to read all the data out of HBase into this other whatever memory structure and then limit it, right? Well, we run on the HBase coprocessor. So we actually push the entire stack to, to the point of where you're, you're needing to shuffle the data because you don't have the right locality. So you're going to aggregate or something, you have to shuffle it. So we push that all the way uh, down to HBase. So all of that is going on on the HBase node. That's how you get the performance. You have to push, you have to push not just like restrictions onto it, but you have to do aggregations and all of that. You have to restrict the amount of data going across the network. The network is your enemy. We say that every day at Splice. It's true every day at Splice. Anytime we have to do something over the network, our costs are significant. And our cost-based optimizer penalizes us heavily for anything that requires a lot of network. Um, and that's the one thing I've learned through this whole system is that the network is not your friend. It's really where your latency comes in in these systems. Um, okay, aggregations, they're serially comp computed uh, in Derby. Ours are pushed to each of the shards, i.e. regions, and then they're spliced back together, with, hence the name of the company. Join plans, Derby had two. Uh, basically hash, if they could pull it off, there was an echo join, and then everything else was nested loop, which doesn't scale either. Um, so what we did is we implemented um, five different join plans. Uh, we did broadcast. That's when you have a really big table and a really small table. And what you do is you push that little small table to every region server that has regions for that really big table that you're scanning. Okay? So that's a classic broadcast. You broadcast it all over the place, all over the network. Um, we do sort merge. So that's when you have two tables and you're joining them by not primary keys, no indexes, no nothing. You're just making your own keys up on the fly and that requires you to reshuffle both the tables so that you can then merge them together so the scans can actually run um, in a single uh, straight scan. So you have to actually write the data and merge it around. Uh, that's the sort merge. Merge is when, let's say you have a customer table and you have an address table. And the primary key on the customer table is customer ID. And the primary, let's say you create an index on the address table, which is customer address ID and maybe a field you want or whatever. You try to run a join there, you don't have to sh shuffle data at all. You can just open scans and read and join um, because they're both sorted. So that we take the advantage of the fact that HBase keeps us in a sorted order. So it's an extremely powerful join um, optimization. So when you're taking the hit of sorting data on inserts and things of that nature, you have to make sure you take advantage of it when you're querying it to be able to do these joins of, of sorted data. Does that make sense? The only thing I'm a little nervous about is that I'm not sure. So I'm not sure whether it's a dense index versus a normal B tree. B tree, I would agree. You don't have to go through the extra, the extra mer or sort to do it. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that as the data is stored within HBase itself, that the clustering, or it's not clustering, it's the, um, the DBT term, no. it's for it. The weird thing is you have a primary key. That primary key becomes, in some sense, your partition and your ordering. Right. So, so it's like <coughs> forcing the ordering. It, it is. It's forcing on primary key or index. Those become your ordering. Okay. Um, so it's weird because a lot of systems you can say, here's my partition and then here's my ordering. And in HBase, they're the same set of fields. Yeah, does a lot of work on it. Yeah, but it's extremely powerful when you have the ordering because you can just okay. open scans and shh, do them together. Um, nested loop join, so if you have a non equi join, cross join, something like that, you'll have to do ne uh, nested loop because that's algorithmically how you do that. Um, and then we came up with another one, batch nested loop join. I think Oracle implemented this in maybe Oracle 12, and then MySQL has just recently implemented it. Um, in a distributed system, nested loop is really expensive. So if you have a left side that has 100 rows, and you have a right side um, that has, you know, let's say one row, that you're gonna be looking up on the right side. So you're gonna read 10 customers and then get their unique address from a unique address table. It's really expensive, because then that's 10 network hops over to address. Batch says, okay, read the 10, get the IDs, concurrently call every region that, that these IDs are in, get the data back, and then hash it together. It's ex much faster than a nested loop uh, join. So this is something we've done for one of our clients that was trying to push, and basically you almost have to do this for the TPCC benchmarks 
They're very much designed for singleton databases. And if you're going to be able to do nested loop really quick, um, the batch nested loop join. So once again, learning the network's not our, not our friend. So HBase, um, I'm just going to go through this so everybody understands HBase. Uh, HBase has the nodes of HBase. Well, I'll start at the top. Um, so HBase uses Zookeeper. Uh, Zookeeper is kind of the unsung hero, in my mind, of the Hadoop distribution, and it works really, really well. I've always really enjoyed that because it's one piece that I feel like is really uh, firm. Um, so Zookeeper does coordination. Fancy way of saying that's when you want to try to um, coordinate some truth across the cluster. You generally use Zookeeper to be able to do that. Um, as region servers come up, they register with Zookeeper and say, hey, I'm in the cluster. So when you want to know who's in the cluster, Zookeeper can tell you, hey, this person via, they call it an ephemeral node, that says that there's a connection to Zookeeper that you can use. Um, it's a really neat technology, Zookeeper. Um, so you have region servers. Region servers have shards of data called regions. And they can have different sizes and number of files and, and things of that nature. Um, in those regions, there's a thing called the mem store, and that's that concurrent skipless map. Um, fancy way of saying it's a pretty efficient structure for jamming data in and keeping sort order. Okay. And then when that mem store feel, fills, so after I throw in 100,000 records or a million records, depending on the size of the memory and what's going on, it'll flush. And that's when it takes this sorted structure and writes what's called the store file. And it writes that to um, HDFS. And then that's your actual blocks, HBase blocks that you're going to be reading from. The store file has a really interesting structure. So it has, at the end of it, it kind of tells you um, the information about the leafs in there, and it is an indexed file. So you can go to each of the leaves and find out which block you need to look at. It's sorted, um, but you also have, can know which leaf you need to look at. And then each of the leaf um, leaves are really cool because they have um, a structure called a, uh, now I'm blanking on it, which is terrible. Oh, flunking computer science 101. Um, it is a probabilistic, help me out somebody, prob it's a, what? Bloom filter. Thank you, bloom filter. So each of these leaves have a bloom filter, which um, tells you whether a record's there or not. In snapshot isolation, that's really handy for us, because it can tell you if the record's already there, like when you're writing and things like that. And it doesn't have to actually go to disk to check it, which is really cool. Um, so as you write to the mem store, it's going to also write to this uh, write-ahead log, which is there in case the system crashes. And if it crashes, then you read that write-ahead log to get your truth. Um, interesting enough, as you write data, the DFS, the, the HDFS client, um, down in like the lower mechanisms of that code, it always writes to the local node first. So you always have data locality on writes. And then the replication, it'll then replicate to your, your other nodes as, you, as you're going through that. Uh, the H master is there for dictionary level operations, for assignment. So it'll assign the regions. So you can write your own assignment manager. We did it twice. Um, you can also write um, like different ways to handle compactions and other maintenance type operations, which we did as well at Splice. So it allows you to really customize the key value store. It's a really nice feature uh, as an ISV running on top of, of HBase. Any questions or anything? I know I'm flying through it, but I don't want to. I have a question there. I'm gonna yes, sir. So HH or the Hadoop player still has a file system here. Talking before about the clustering part of it. So does that imply that there's also splitable pages or splitable files to ensure that that, that clustering is, is kept intact? Or what Great question. Yeah. So the way it works is um, it's so as so let's say that on this region that you're running, um, you're going to so you, let's say you write a million records into the mem store and it flushes a store file. Mm -hmm. Great. Write another million uh, records, flushes another store file. You have two sorted files. So if it needs to do any sort of I.O. operation, it has to open both files. They're indexed, so it has to do two I.O. Opera operation on each file, find it, and then open a scanner, right? Then they have this concept, what's called um, compaction. And compaction allows you to take those multiple files and have them still available for queries and everything like that, and then put those two files together. They're immutable. You can't change it once they're there. You just put more data in the mem store and other files. But in compaction, and then you merge those together into a single file. 
So if you have to do I.O., you do one I.O. operation in the index piece. Did that answer your question? Okay. Um, how many people, sorry, how many people have worked with HBase in the room? Holy smokes. That's amazing to me. Um, how many people have never heard of HBase in the room? That's very good. That's great. Cool. Um, so how do we do it? Um, so the SQL client pops up. Uh, you can connect by JDBC, ODBC. It'll be parsed, planned, optimized. And then uh, those are pushed to each of the regions. On each region, they'll start to execute. When it executes, it understands serialization, um, indexes that are available, and snapshot isolation. Serialization, uh, we spend a tremendous amount of time on our serialization. We store all of our data in byte sorted order, and we pack it all into one row, i.e. one column. So we basically store it like a relational database would. Why do we do this? If you take a normal, let's say, what was the example we did? It was like a 50 row or 50 column table in Oracle uh, with bar chart 20. It's like kind of normal order header type table. And you put it just like that into HBase. And the columns in HBase correspond and the names are all the same, etc. cetera. But we'll ask this question, how big would it be? If it was one terabyte in Oracle, how big would it be in HBase? With compression. 10 terabytes. Because right? in Oracle, you have bit set index, which is what fields are set, 0, 1, 0, 0, that kind of stuff. And then they're all packed together, the bytes with the links and everything in them. In HBase, they're stored as key values. So there's a key which is uh, you know, your bytes for your key, which isn't terrible. Then you have your family or your store name, your family name. Then you have your column name. Those are all byte when you put in job, you know, column first name. Well, first name is, let's say you put them all together, that was five, four, nine, nine bytes. So you kill nine bytes there doing nothing, just telling what the column is for each row. Um, and then you have a timestamp for each column has, a t has its own timestamp and value. So what happens is you create an I.O. structure that doesn't work. So I'll walk into company and said, I used HBase and that thing was darn slow. And I said, okay, well, how did you serialize the data? I went in there and I took whatever's in my relational database and I jammed it in each column in HBase. And I said, well, it's slow because to scan 10 terabytes of data takes a long time because you can't fix I.O. Once it's broken, it's broken. So uh, what we did is we stored in a packed representation. So with compression and replication, we're on par. That was our design goal. So if you give me a terabyte of data, um, I'm going to generate with compression and replication, which basically cancel each other out. They're both about 3x. So we do 3x replication, 3x compression in general. Um, we'll, we'll get par size in splice machine and storage. So does that make sense? I think that's one part of the Hadoop architecture that people don't talk about. Um, if you're wanting to get low latency, I.O. matters. Um, you know, I think that's why Srivas is, and since we have some map art here, um, you know, I think he shares that common concept of it's very important. I mean, you cannot fix that after the fact. You have to try to use as little amount of data on disk as possible because you have to read it. And that's where the time comes in. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, what's that? Compress your data. Compress your data and um, serialize it effectively. So what we did is, so we, we made the data very small. And the thing that was really nice, I think, not brilliant, I won't go that far, but what was really cool is by storing it in sortable bytes, when you say, hey, I don't have an index on this field, but I want to check where first name equals John, I can take that qualifier John, turn it into bytes, and I can scan through, and I don't have to convert those bytes to a string and then do comparison. I can do byte level comparison. So I can just say, hey, these bytes and these bytes, they equal? Nope, go. That's extremely quick. So that's one of the things that, if you're going to build a database on top of Hadoop, the serialization, or if you're evaluating them, serialization is a really important piece. How big is the data on disk? Because that's going to take a while to, build, to, to scan through. And then also look at the way they're applying predicates. 
Are they doing a byte level comparison or are they converting to objects? If they're converting to objects, you know what you're going to have? Heat problems. Why? Because you're creating a lot of objects. If you scan a billion records and you need to convert to a billion strings, you just created a billion strings. And you're going to have heat pressure. But if you just do byte level comparison, the key values are already there in the block, you can just look at it and say, yes, this is something that we want to look at. Yes, sir? Since you're talking about uh, compression, yeah. uh, columnar store databases have much higher compression than their own Much store. higher compression. But they're you know, usually used for uh, read type databases. You know, they're like structured for read. They're really difficult to do OLTP against a columnar store. So I was just wondering what kind of, have, did you do any studies like what kind of throughput uh, you yeah. have? So, um, so I have an interesting, okay, so let, I'll take this kind of presentation aside for a second. Um, the way databases are going forward, uh, they're no longer OLTP OLAP. They're um, hybrids where data comes in row-based, so you have to have row-based transactions, and then you convert it to some sort of columnar structure for read-only type queries. Um, probably the one that's most famous for it, or the best paper is the C-Store paper by Stonebreaker, um, and then that's now Vertica, which is a very effective software product for taking in row-based data and then having a columnar representation of it for, for querying. Um, why do you need to do row-based? You need to be able to do row-based to do updates and inserts in real time. Now, Vertica wouldn't say, hey, you can run an OLTP app against them because they're not there. That, that wasn't their focus. Um, but they do a very nice, they can say, um, I want to ingest 100,000 records an hour and still be able to do analytics query on it. They can say that with confidence. Um, so for me, I always cringe when I hear columnar and row-based and you know, I really feel like a database system that's going to be coherent is going to have to have both of those um, and even some newer technology that we've been working on at Splice to kind of go, it's not even columnar anymore, it's much more do you have, have you already computed the data before? So have you already joined the data before? Do you have, um, for lack of a better word, kind of a materialized view floating around somewhere that is still transactionally correct Do you have any updates to the data? If that's still out there, you need to use that. So um, the databases we have now are row-based, like Splice, or they're columnar or using Parquet or those types of formats. Um, but I think the database that will win will be able to handle both um, and do it still in a transactional nature. Because if you think about like an ETL process, you have to have transactions at night. But during the day, you may have a lot of reads. And if nothing's being written to, then the data should be converted to a columnar format for, for quick reads. Um, but yes, columnar, better compression, better I.O., uh, faster, faster speeds, um, but you have to build it in such a way where you can still support uh, row-based writes, and then you have to kind of reason about how you're going to run both the systems. Um, so what did we do to HBase? The one that was the biggest for us was our asynchronous write pipeline. Writes to HBase are terrible. Um, what they do is they block. So if you read a thousand records and you want to send them across the wire, while you're sending them across the wire, you're not reading more records. That doesn't work in a database. A database has to have asynchronous write pipelines where you're, you're reading a million rows as fast as humanly possible, and, you're in, and you may have ten concurrent writes going on and those writes need to be flushable. So at the end, you flood your guarantee that, hey, these did sync over there, wherever they were going, um, but they have to do it in a non-blocking way. Um, I know it's kind of nuanced computer science, but it's, it's really important when you're trying to say, why is this thing slow? So if you spin up HBase and run MapReduce and do puts, well, they block each other, so it's going to be slow. So kind of strap in and you know, have some time on your hands. Um, Another thing we did is we write data in the indexes and constraints concurrently. So once you have an asynchronous write pipeline, you can kind of get fancy. So when I'm writing to my name table, I can have a kind of a Java and I.O. structure where I say, hey, while I'm writing here, I've got four other writes to those indexes need to happen. Those can all happen concurrently. So as you add indexes, you don't say, oh my gosh, I added an index. This thing doubled in time. It will double in time if you overwhelm, like you, you, you don't have the capacity to write, but if you do, and in most of these systems you do, 
um, you can do it in, a, in the time you would in a, in a single data write. Uh, and like I said before, we batch the writes in chunks. Uh, that's a big one. So if you're writing 100 records in HBase, make sure it does one wall edit versus doing 100 uh, F-Syncs, because that's a huge penalty. For, uh, for your resource management, do you have support for Mesos and Yarn for managing the uh, Yeah, so <laughs> I always get these in sales deals. All right, so um, Yarn. Um, yes, you can run HBase and Yarn. Our resource manager is much more, it's in the weeds. What do I mean by that? Our resource manager is really, it's modeled after the Linux scheduling um, concept. So it's a, it's a task stealing queue and it's different. So in, in Yarn you say, hey, I need this much memory, I need this much CPU, and this is how I'm gonna play nicely with someone. In us, it's more like, okay, that's fine. You've set these general parameters, get it. Our scheduling is much more about, okay, based on this constraints that we've been put in, how many tasks can run in the DML queue? How many tasks can run in the DDL queue? And we always have to have a queue open for dictionary operations. So if I'm running a 10 billion row by 10 billion row join, and, and, and I'm configured to use all the capacity of the cluster, when you connect, you still have to be able to do show tables or show indexes to show the dictionary. So the dictionary has a different queue. So what we've tried to do is we, we use Mesos, we support Mesos and Yarn, for the overarching, and then inside our resource scheduler, because we, it's gotta be really fast for us because you're constantly, I mean, it's like compare and swap up the laws. I mean, you're constantly going in and out of that resource uh, manager in like an OLTP scenario or an OLAP scenario. Um, so, but we try to go down to the different, the smaller levels um, on that. And then we also have a governor for rights. So one of the funny things is we wrote this asynchronous write pipeline, real proud of ourselves, some consultant said, I'm going to create a 10 billion row index. Boom, not boom, nodes just kept failing. I'm like, what? And you realize, yeah, we could write a ton. HBase just fell over because it was too much. We were trying to write like 300,000 records a second each. I mean, no, it couldn't, it couldn't handle that on each of the nodes. So what we had to do was write a governor in our resource manager that says, here's the most writes this node's going to accept. At that, if, if, it, if it's more than that, we'll tell it to back off. And we'll send a message back to the pipeline and say, hey, back off for a bit, too much. I, I can't handle this, so it'll, it'll have a little delay and then try to resend it and, and process it. So we're really focused on trying to make the thing stable. Because that's been another problem with HBase. It's really, the only governor they had on it was um, called uh, the IPC server threads, which was a fancy say is there was a, a resource pool once it filled up, you couldn't even connect to H. You couldn't do anything with HBase. Basically, you would just queue on this thread piece, which was a, which sucked because you'd run it and you can't even give it a response because you're waiting for things to do. So we've kind of changed that to where when we hit a limit, we send a response back to the client saying, "Here's what you should do." And our our write pipeline is very sophisticated. It understands both regions too busy and those types of exceptions, but it also understands relational semantic exceptions. So if you're doing the right pipeline and you have a primary key exception, shut the whole thing down. You're rolling back and it's over. Uh, you violated the primary key. Everything you were doing is dead. So it knows which exceptions to retry um, and to fail transactions in the case that the retries don't work and you don't know what happened. It can fail transactions, but uh, it's really focused on, on that piece. Uh, sparse data support is important, so uh, we store it, like I said, in a row, and we have different bit sets that allow us to do sparse support, um, which, is, which is nice. So if you're doing an update of a 2,000 column table and you're only going to write one column, our bit index will say, hey, we're updating position four, um, which is an integer. So, and that will allow us to do that. Um, Non-blocking schema changes, so um, when splice comes up, we create... 76 tables in HBase, I think, which are dictionary tables. And those are governed by snapshot isolation as well. So based on your timestamp that you receive in Splice um, and your, your read um, context, you'll be able to see different dictionaries. So you can add columns in a DDL transaction, and there's no read-write locks while adding columns. Um, and we don't store nulls, which is a, a good one um, for like omniture data, which I learned painfully. Here's our SQL 99 coverage. Um, I know it's kind of an eye chart, but uh, just to kind of show you 
Uh, these are the type of the, the SQL that we're, we're using. So the support information schema? Support information, so you can do like show tables, show indexes. Yeah, query, uh, query about the entire schema. You, the whole schema, yeah. Which is kind of your, your JDBC metadata concept. But right. yes. Yeah, so you can do like show tables, show indexes, those sorts of things. So when you do this lossless thing, what exactly happens when you, you know, do an update on the same one that's getting dropped in the history? Remember, in HBase, you never update. Insert. Yes. <laughs> right? You insert with the timestamp. And snapshot yeah, isolation is about you, so um, if we have let's say we have a let's say we have a um, a, uh, a record a customer record that was written um, with a timestamp of 200 so that record and has like 10 columns in it and you want to come up and update your first name at timestamp 500 205 500 is your you're going to update it great um, and then when you read you reason about it well I'm reading at timestamp three this is very a gross simplification of our transaction system but I just want to kind of give you a sense so if you're reading at 300 you don't see the right at 400 you reason about it and say well I'm at timestamp 300 ignore the 400 I'm going to see what was there so the read and uh, right answer the read one the insert and the drop I'm inserting some value in the column and at the same time probably another thing is dropping the column Right, but you're always dropping the column with tombstones. So in snapshot isolation, um, you can always go back and see your data at a point in time. It's a temp best way to say is it's a temporal database. So at any point in time, you can get a truth. So you can look back. What did the database look like at noon? Technically, you can you can do that. Oracle has that capability. Now it's called flashback, um, and that's on our roadmap to to get. I mean, once you have snapshot isolation, it's pretty straightforward to do. Um, but everything is tombstone based. So if you drop a column, you're really just adding tombstones. You're not actually physically yeah, so doing anything. Does that mean that, I mean, uh, even the concurrency thing, if I drop a column today, mm -hmm. will I still be able to insert values into it tomorrow? Um, you won't be able to see it because your dictionary will say it doesn't exist. Right? Remember the parse bind phase? You don't even see, you don't know that that actually exists. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because your dictionary is part of your planning phase, and it says, hey, John, you've got these four columns because you dropped column five. So I don't even see column five. And part of your drop, you wrote tombstones in column five as of that timestamp. Gross simplification, but generally you just have a timestamp there, right? So you know that you, cannot, you can't see that data, and you can't see it from a dictionary perspective because it, it doesn't actually exist. So if I select the timestamp just before the dropping the column, will I be able to see that column? Yes. Yeah, that's the definition of snapshot isolation. Because once you have snapshot isolation, backups or incremental backups are really easy. Um, everything's easy because you can always go back to a point in time and say, I want to know what the database looked like at midnight. And you know, Jim could be running a 50 billion row insert, doesn't matter, right? Because we have snapshot isolation and we say, hey, that hasn't committed yet. We don't see it. We'll get a consistent view of all committed transactions at midnight. This is, of course, based on how many versions you tell HBase to save, right? Right, and we say all. All? Yeah, and then part of our backup concept is to be able to slough off and say, hey, we're not going to keep, so how many, you know, we have basically a transaction timeout mechanism. Stop their processes. I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but we have a transaction timeout mechanism, so if things are running for like three days, it'll time out the transaction. Once the transactions are timed out, you can push forward with a backup you can push forward and they can, you know, as part of combining the record, I don't want to give away too much, but as part of combining it away, you can then get rid of the multiple versions. Because there's that problem of, I have a table and I update the record and I update it, you know, every so, day. So, or so if I update it once a second or once yes. a millisecond, at you'll what, have all those versions. At what point am I going to start seeing performance degradation? Um, good question. Um, and, and the reason I ask is because there was another. Uh, in the early days of HBase, there was a company who said, oh, our columnar store is so much faster than HBase. When we set HBase to hold one million versions, and then we tell ours to do a million versions, we're 1,500 times faster than they are. Well, sure. technically speaking, you could use HBase to store versions in a different way than it was yeah. and make it as fast as what they were doing. So well, the versioning thing is an interesting one. There are some pretty interesting opti optimizations because... On the store files, you can ignore certain things on different versions. Because I always think of it conceptually like I have a million uh, records in one place. 
In a lot of cases, you have a bunch of different store files and you have a bunch of different leaves and they can move around and skip between versions pretty effectively. Um, the other thing is, if I read, so let's say I have a million versions, the IO's not good because you, or I shouldn't say the disk storage is bad. The IO, I read the first version and it says, oh, I got all my fields and they're all populated. Sweet, I'm done. You don't read all million, you just read that first one. And if it's true, then you're fine. Now you could get in situations where, let's say you had a field that had 50 columns and you just updated one column continuously. Um, you would have to take the first column, skip through all the rest of the data that just had that one column change, and then go down to the truth, which is your other columns. So you can get in situations where that's, that's not a good thing. Uh, that's why I like sequences we do outside of SI. A sequence is you know, more of a compare and swap kind of concept um, and, and do stuff like that. But that, that is a good point in Postgres, et cetera. Uh, we have a manual vacuum co command, which you can call and it'll cleanse a, a table. Uh, based to back to a certain timestamp for that situation, you know, specifically. But it's it, that's an unfortunate in a SI based system. So with these snapshots, does that mean that we don't really need a transaction based system anymore? No, snapshot isolation is how Postgres, Oracle, all of these sophisticated databases work. If you have a Aries based system like Derby did, that was the old one. You took a row, you locked it said, boy, I'm changing this, don't touch it. You go to the block, you change it. Those, just, those days are over. It's much more of a multi-version system because that's where you get blocker, you know, readers not blocking writers, writers not blocking readers. Well, I, mean, I was more, more you know, with the backups, in a way like, I mean, you can always, you don't have to roll back, right? You can always go back to a previous version. Does that make sense? Um, that's not the same thing as transactions. Transactions going to be across different locations, right? It's not... If you're just updating one single row, you're not really doing a transaction, right? At the point you say, insert, you're done. Yeah. The transaction's going to matter when you say, insert here and insert here, and make sure that they both happen consistently. So you can't do it, basically, well, my favorite one is people doing indexes. You can't do an index without a transaction. That's why, one of the reasons why transactions were really popular. Because then if you want to keep those two, well, I say you can do it, but you can't keep them consistent um, on, on inserts. So transactions are there, when, as Jim said, when you have many regions and region servers participating, you have complex SQL. Um, so like when you take a table and splice that's a billion rows, and you do insert into, select star, whatever, and you th throw it into the other table, you say create, or it should say, you have a massive customer table, it's a terabyte, and you want to create a backup of it in the database. And you do create table as, select from customer, right? Everybody's done it. Well, that allows us to do that in a transactional context. That's not happening on one region server. The reads are happening on hundreds of region servers and the writes are happening on hundreds of region servers. All those writes have to be governed by a transaction because I could write 500 records and not get a response. Well, what happened? Did the node go down? Did it just flake out on me? If that happens, I need to fail the transaction and retry the read and write. And I have to retry the read based on a snapshot so that I'm not getting you know, new, new, read, new uh, writes that happened after my read. So without snapshot isolation, as a concurrency model, databases are really hard to reason and, and make work. Um, definitely HBase is impossible. So if I see somebody who did an HBase system without snapshot isolation, and without really complex snapshot isolation, I say there's no way it works. That's just my general, um, and I should say Apache HBase to clarify. But Apache HBase, because it has, you know, it could become unavailable. If you don't have transactions to be able to roll back and recorrect time, like you could split in the middle of you doing something. Well, what do you do? Which record's committed? Which, which did anything? If you don't know, you have to fail the transaction and retry it again. And then thus, once you commit, they'll see a consistent view of the data. All this has to go on behind the scenes. A user just knows they ran a query and it completed fast. But we know, as people who know Hadoop and HBase, it's actually a pretty complex mechanism to make sure you see consistent views of the data. And here, this is a terrible slide on our, um, our snapshot isolation. We're, just to be blunt, we don't tell a lot of people the low level details. Uh, but one thing I would say, and people I want to kind of give a shout out to, um, there's some great papers. Uh, Google Percolator was kind of a, a reasoning of snapshot isolation on Bigtable that they did. Um, 
There's a guy who wrote a, um, a product called Omid. His name's Daniel Faro Gomez, and he, he works for Splice Machines, one of my colleagues. Um, and he, you know, and he really helped me get a headspace around snapshot isolation. He has a really great paper, a critique of snapshot isolation. It's a great white paper if you really want to reason about DDL and how, how all this works. Um, it's a really, really cool paper I would encourage you to take a look at. Um, and then at the University of Waterloo, um, uh, there, um, I can't remember Chen's first, first name, I just called Chen, it's terrible. Um, it, it's Chen, and he did a pro project called HBase SI, which was an initial kind of similar reasoning, and he works for Splice Machine as well. Um, so it's a very, very interesting uh, thing when you talk about snapshot isolation um, on, in acid transactions which are really gaining popularity now because you hear people talking about HBase and ACID properties. A lot of the systems um, are geared towards OLTP, so they'll buffer writes. Our system's a little different because we really wanted to support it for both OLTP and OLAP, which is, I think, what took us so long to market, to be honest. Um, we do have BI and SQL support for, for ODBC, um, which is kind of a nice feature. Um, that guy. Um, I put this on there, and if it's too salesy, I'll, I'll batch it. But what I wanted to kind of say is, if I go into a deal, and I'm competing against Impala, one of us is in the wrong deal. And I wanted to kind of make that, because I, I always go to a, like a trade show or someone will say, I've got Impala, and I'm like, okay. That's not our space. Our space is much more the Oracle Postgres space. It's a space where you're updating data. It's where you have DB2, Oracle, generally big iron in big companies um, run. So the way I look at the database market's a little different. There's analytics-based approaches, and there's operational-based uh, approaches. And some of those can go into OLTP and OLAP because a lot of operational systems are just required to run some lightweight OLAP. Um, I view it as there's a SQL on a dupe piece. Um, and there's even a SQL on HBase, but like Phoenix and those types of tools, they're very still focused on analytics, and they're uh, more, more tool. They're not like relational databases. They're a little different. Um, Hawk, I think this is kind of critical of Hawk. Hawk has a lot of relational concepts. It has some transactional understanding. Um, the way that they did Postgres gives you some challenges as well, because a lot of, not Hawk in general, but most Postgres clones, they then have to do two-phase commit over the top because their snapshot isolation is on each node, where ours is kind of global uh, above all the nodes, so they act in concert. Um, I think that's kind of hard on those guys. And I know people, in, and the one thing I would say on the SQL and the Duke crowd, these guys, I would suggest looking back at them every three to six months because the products are going to change so dramatically. They'll start building different systems. Um, it's definitely an arms race. I see some of the things that the guys are doing. It's neat stuff. I think some of those guys will move around here. Uh, the higher cost ones are very established players. Um, I would say on these higher cost people, the one nice thing about them, they work. We all laugh. They're, they're good products. I'll never go in and say, oh, uh, you know, Oracle doesn't work. Yeah, it works. If you did a financial transaction, it probably went through an Oracle database. It works. It's expensive, but it works, and it will scale up. Um, likewise, Teradata, very expensive. You talk to a Teradata customer, they really like Teradata. They don't like the check, but they, they think it works well. They think, and I maybe grew, I mean, everybody's got issues with it, but in general, I don't hear a lot of people saying, oh, I gotta get off that. They say maybe it's too expensive, or I wanna offload some data, but they, they like the products. So I think the key thing uh, for me, and why I kinda wanna show this is, there are a lot of products out there that work very well, um, that may not be on Hadoop, uh, but are lower risk for people. And the big challenge for all the players on the top is to be able to demonstrate, um, basically demonstrate effectiveness um, and get to more sophisticated capabilities, um, whether it's on the analytics side or on the uh, transactional side. Um, so this is what people, this is my salesy slide that someone threw in here. Uh, what do they say? Key innovator, yeah right. Yikes. Um, the only Hadoop RDBMS, so if you get anything from it, um, 
our, our vision is more just asset transactions on top of HBase. Um, and you can try us. So we have a free download and feel free to do a proof of concept. I was gonna um, just kind of do a quick, I know we're late here and I don't want to keep everybody. So I have a quick question. So the, you are in the RDBMS uh, you know, topology. Mm -hmm. uh, like now, how do you like those? You have traditional databases, DB2, Oracle. Yeah. So you have like stream of transactions coming from traditional to this uh, Hadoop. Yeah. Uh, how do you think? Like, do you have any mechanism replication or something? Oh yeah. So we've had people use Golden Gate. We actually hired a guy from Golden Gate. Um, okay. So you have Golden Gate. Okay. You have um, stream processing engines. They all have queues. The queues have transaction isolation. So if you do a queue well, um, so let's say you're using Spark and they're batching things. You batch 50 records, you do a 50 row insert into Splice or you roll back. So you have queuing mechanisms to so replicate. Splice has like the inbuilt uh, mechanism to read that queue or like you have to write some program to do that? SQL. Begin okay. transaction, insert the records. J Java or uh, any sort of you can write you can write Java JDBC connection or you can just write SQL to do it. Yeah, you have to do that. Right? It's not like uh, when you say Golden Gate, you have Oracle or DB2. Yeah. You configure source and target. It automatically. Yeah, no, Golden Gate does that. I don't mention Golden Gate for people to use because it's it's a pretty sophisticated and expensive problem. Yeah, so uh, but but yes, you can do that. We can execute the insert statements from Golden Gate. Golden Gate says so this is a schema, and you can do inserts. Yeah. I just, we don't see that a lot because it's pretty yeah, expensive. It's loosely coupled. Are you saying it is loosely coupled yeah. from source to your slice? But it's, but it's not, it's still transactional though. So if it doesn't happen, it goes and they retry it to happen. That's the key. The key is the transactional nature, even a Golden Gate or a Q. If, and if you say... I don't uh, get, like, I think we're going off track. So what I'm saying is you have a row. I'll just give a simple example. Sure. If you have a table, yep. uh, inserts are happening. You right. say like you use Golden Gate, so the transactions are going to the Golden Gate queue. Like a, you have a queue mm -hmm. in between, it's going into the queue. Yep. So uh, how do you pick from that queue to the splice? It it'll say the the thing we saw from our POC. It says insert into customer. It has the insert statement and it it carries that across in the queue, and then you run that and we we execute the SQL. Oh, so you, okay, you have to configure in the splice basically. Gets sent the, the DML gets sent across the wire. It just runs. So Golgate mines the logs, grabs the SQL statements, reverses the, the block changes, puts them in a DML statements, ships the DML statements into the, the, the um, extract from the file. And, yeah. file. and then you say insert into values, and it's all there, and it just runs it. Oh, they just run some. Yeah. yeah. So it's very much DML, but, which has its own inefficiencies of having the DML, but yes. Um, so I just wanted to show this. I probably did quick. So this is it has its own little command line client. Um, so you can show tables on this. Um, I really populate some good tables, um, but this shows you your system tables. So you have like sys statistics, um, sys tables, those sorts of things. I, I did want to show you the optimizer behind the scenes because I know this is kind of a, a smart group. Um, this shows you kind of the cost base. I wanted to print these out for you, but. And, and sorry, the screen size is a little weird, but it shows all the different nodes in the cost-based optimizer as it's trying to compute show tables. Um, so I just wanted to show that because show tables is a tough one in most databases because database um, system tables are highly structured. So you're doing a lot of joins, you're doing projections, unions, those sorts of things. Um, so you can do that. You can also, so I've got a simple import script. Hopefully it'll spool to the screen. Yeah, great. So it just goes through, this is like your normal create table, and then you, God, it goes too fast here. Um, let me stop for a second. Okay, so this is where it's loading 2 million CSVs, so you'll see these go across. Um, that's the, the call sysutil, and then those files exist in um, HDFS. And you can run Splice as a one install, like on your machine, if you want to test it with like Hibernate or something like that. And in that case, it'll use your local file system, which is how I'm configured right, right now. Um, but that allows you to go through and it runs a bunch of SQL statements uh, to do that. Now, you know, if you get something out of this, well, what's, what's so special about Splice? Um, so if I come in and say auto commit off, 
delete from board line. This is a very simple one. Hey, there's no rolls. There's no rows. Roll back. Yeah, there are. Okay. That sounds really simple, but that allows you to basically run an application. Because all applications are based on transactional semantics. Um, how do you see the fast, you know, fast snapshot? We've got a feature request for that. That's that. Um, so if you go to Oracle and you look at their flashback functionality, they've got six or seven different features. Um, one of it, one of them is to run a query from a specific point in time, and then they've got another one that shows all versions of all changes in the data. But but we haven't done that. We haven't. You'd you'd want us to enable it because right now it's just all bytes jammed together. So you, we would need to write it, um, and it's not, that, that one's not that hard for us to do. It just hasn't been prioritized, i.e. a customer hasn't said, we've got to have this showing all versions of the data or, you know, we're not going to buy splice. So if you're saving all the versions, right, so yeah. you are not deleting any other versions, that saves. Except on backups, I mean, you can, and you can run vacuum to do it if you have a use case to do it. By default, we don't um, delete the versions. So uh, here... You mentioned that update doesn't happen, right? So, can we run an update query on this? Yeah. So, in that time, the old version will be overridden by the new version, right? That's Never overridden. It's a multi-version concerns. It creates another... It, so, so when you, But once we select from the key, you get only the new version, right? That's correct. In your transaction, and then when you commit it, other people with new transactions then will see it. So, it's, it's all about everybody. When you, when you start your transaction... Yeah. And the consistent read of that token is stored with the file or the record that's actually put out there. So if you updated a record three different times, that record's only three different times. It's just checking your, whatever time that you came in to say, here's the version that I saw. So it's a consistent yeah. view. It's not the same. Some of like Oracle. Right. Right. So yes. if you're updating a billion rows, right, you expect that's going to take at least a good 10 seconds. Right? I don't care what system you're in. <laughs> right. Okay? We don't. So <laughs> I'm in here querying, and I say, select star from this table. And you run your update, and you now are row by row creating a new version for this column that you're updating. Right? I'm looking at the version that when I started querying, your update is hitting every one of those columns. When I run a query again and your update is finished, I'm now looking and querying the next version. You know what's even more brilliant about it? While you're writing, all your writes have a timestamp greater than mine. I ignore your store files. I don't even have to do the I.O. operation. That is what's nice. Because I always wondered, people would say to me, well, why don't you slow down when we're writing? And I thought, why don't we slow down when we're writing? And then I realized under the covers, HBase is smart enough to ignore store files. You can put a timestamp. Um, one of the developers did this. I didn't even know they did it. Um, but put a limit on the timestamp of the timestamp and less. And it ignores um, all those files, which I thought was really cool. So you can be writing, banging the heck out of the database. And it almost seems like your reads aren't affected because you're not really looking at any of this new, if you had to go look through all this I.O., you know, all these new files that probably aren't in the block cache and all that sort of thing, it'd be really painful, but it's, it's, an, it's a really neat, you realize like these, you realize Oracle and Postgres, I've got a whole new understanding. Um, our advisory board has some leaders from, um, from those companies on it, and uh, I have a whole new appreciation for some of the technology that's built there. So does, I'm assuming HBase has the same concept of like a select property, um, so HBase is get put scans and then it does row level um, consistently, consistency. That's it. Um, right. If you want to do an update, you have to get an input. Right. But there's no way to do it in a selection hold that block, preventing no. you from going out there and updating it. So going back to the transaction manager. Um, there is a compare and swap concept in HBase where you can do, um, you can say, hey, I, I reason that the data looks like this. And if it doesn't, then don't do my commit, and then I'll retry to compare and swap and get the new. Does that make sense? So, so like, you guys like for update, you're automatically converting that back to your compare and swap type logic. HBase has that. We do a totally different thing where we're 
we're much more, we would say things like, you know, you have a right-right conflict, somebody tried to change it while you're doing it, those sorts of concepts. Um, but HBase has a, um, a low-level mechanism that is, um, I'm trying to remember what they call it, it's, a, it's basically a compare and swap, you do a, a remote put, which is, a, this isn't a good one either, but um, they do a remote put and they check for the value, and if the value's there, the, then you write the new value. If not, they give you the new value back and keep bouncing across the network. Where ideally you want to ship it across the network, then do your compare and swap iteration and, and do it, but it does it, the network hop. But yes, HBase has that core functionality, but it's all get put scans. You figure out your serialization, you figure it's just a key value. Yes, sir. I just have kind of a vague question, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, is there a use case that you come across where time series uh, data wants to be studied, and so you want to go look at those different versions. That's actually the subject of your study, and how does Spike Machine play that? That's the Oracle flashback. We've got we've got one software as a service company that is in the like basically I keep not answering calls from because that's you know it's it, we'll keep telling them hey it's just you're the only one so far and you know it's like there's only some you know you have 50 people you got to figure out where to or to do it. Um, I think more and more people are gonna look for temporal databases. I've seen use cases with, um, uh, you know, trading firms wanting to know their positions at different times of the day. Cause I mean, in essence, you could know, you could look back and do really cool stuff. Um, I've also seen it with like actuarial type stuff. Um, insurance is big on that for understanding risk. Like how did my risk profile change? Mm -hmm. Those sorts of things. So I've seen, I've seen use cases for it. Um, but they haven't been beating down. I don't know if those industries are established enough that they, they may be late adopters to new database technology. I don't know. I'm not seeing them across my, mm -hmm. if you know, you, kind of my list. If you want to do a use case like that on HBase, typically what you'll end up doing is you'll take and have your key uh, format that you're going to use, and then you'll follow that with an inverted timestamp. Inverted. Yeah, so you take long max value minus now, and you use that as the key. So then when I write again the next time, I'm gonna automatically get a new key, and I'm gonna store the value, so then you can go do range scans over your key mm -hmm. across time and get all those records, and then you can see how things are changing over time. Mm -hmm. But then but then you're actually, but that's kind of cheating though, because then you're it, saying, you don't actually, you're creating the, the multi-version in right. the relational scale. It's a case, in your case. It's not a built-in, it's more of a. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, yes. In your case, you don't want to use the HBase built-in versioning. It's a bad thing. Because you have to go query it once every time with every timestamp. It's not set up for that. Right, that's not what it's for. It's there to say, in, in this use case they're using, at this point in time, what was the value? If you go in and say, I wanna do a temporal analysis, you're gonna literally have to go in and say, query backwards over time over all the potential records that are there mm -hmm. and pull them all out separately. You can't just go scanning over them easily. Then the challenge there is then you have to have your schema representative of a temporal schema. So you have to have timestamp and all your updates have to understand timestamps. The challenge with that, where that breaks down, is then all your writes, like if you want to update a single record, it has to then read the record before it to be able to put the whole data in. So it both breaks down. Because we went, I went through this painstaking detail with a, a guy who runs a software as a service company. It's really passionate about this. Both methods are very difficult to do well. Because in that, in your case there, if you want to have another version of it, and I want to update first name John, I need to know last name Leach, blah, 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 all that other has to be written there as well. Mm -hmm. So there's both systems I think are very, I think if, I would love to see a better job of Temporal, but I haven't uh, seen it yet. You know, quite honestly, if you have that situation, you're probably gonna be best off looking at like the Lambda architecture as a way to model it. So where you have your system of records storing all of this batch data, you can go straight to files. Mm -hmm. And then when you want to do a temporal analysis, you go back to the files. You want to rebuild a current view from a batch side because you possibly inject bugs into your streaming side. You've got the ability to go back and always do that from the temporal side. But 99% of the time, nobody cares about all of that temporal data you're storing. Yeah. Especially from an OLPP standpoint, all garbage. I don't know. We, we will have flashback. No, we'll have that within the year. I'm, I'm guaranteed on that. Um, I don't know how it's going to... It'll be interesting to see the performance of it in different scenarios. Um, 
but you know that's something that's that's on our roadmap. Um, Who's asking for a flashback? Uh, it's a company that. Good question. It's a company that. What's the best? I'm going to do real generic, so you can't figure out who it is. Um, it's a company that does sales. I'm going to butcher it so bad you can't can't. Help. They basically do sales trending, so they look at other service companies that tell your salespeople um, what sort of uh, like what sort of um, like what their leads and everything are. And there, those are being updated all the time, right? Right before the meeting, they put in 100 leads, right? The sales guy does. The person, they don't care about that. They want to be able to look at what do their leads look like this week, this week, this week? Who are the people? How are the accounts transitioning between people? It's actually a smart idea, um, but it's just different. So there's people that do that currently. It's just the systems they built for it are kind of, I mean, Jim probably just, just described it. He's kind of, you know, they built, this, this company actually built a custom database for it. Um, so there's all kinds of weird, weird stuff out there people have built for some of these really cool technologies. Um, but I think they're trying to kind of get back on, on the, on the bit. Um, that's all I had. I'm sorry, I'm keeping you guys way too late. Everybody's like, I want to get out of here. Um, I do have mugs, white papers, books, and I have tons of t-shirts, so please, if you need, everybody needs a workout t-shirt. You can, I won't be <laughs> offended. I don't expect you to wear it to work. It um, is reasonably funny, sure. But but please, yeah, but please um, grab a shirt. You, know, you can always use it to work out. Um, but I really appreciate everyone's time. Thanks. <laughs>